This is the Magic Word Podcast.com. Hello, this is Scott Wells for the Magic Word Podcast.com. What is it that fascinates magicians so much about, well, playing cards for that matter. You see I've got some uh, over here and there and probably all around us. Magicians seem to again have this affinity for playing cards and for some reason we also believe that transcends into our our guests, our audience liking playing cards also. When you stop and think about it, really, I don't think that playing cards enter into the general lay public's vernacular uh, on a regular basis. They don't play a lot of playing cards unless they're in Las Vegas or something. Or Anyhow, magicians are more fascinated by playing cards than I think the general lay public are. But for a lot of interesting and good reasons. And I am one of those also. I love playing cards. There are so many different things you could do with them, obviously sleight of hand, cardistry, collecting, and whatever, and that's what we're going to talk about today is the third part of that I just mentioned, and that is collecting. It's not just collecting, but also I'm fascinated about how these cards are developed, that is, designed and printed and uh, and come to market, basically. And so I was approached by a gentleman who uh, recently started a new Kickstarter campaign in order to raise some funds for developing his next new project, and uh, his name is uh, Jack Brutus Penny. Now, uh, Jack is not a magician, but he's an artist and an author and lives in um, England. Sorry, he's from England, but lives in Japan. He's going to talk about all that and also the development of these uh, works of art that he had created and making into playing cards. And so I thought it'd be interesting to hear his perspective from someone kind of outside of the magic world, if you will, but also who is very integrally uh, entrained within our performing art by developing these magic cards, these playing cards, if you will. And then next to talk with someone who actually is a collector and someone who perhaps, uh, well, to my knowledge, has maybe one of the largest collections of anybody I know. And he'll talk about that and why he has a fascination. And, and perhaps you collect playing cards as well. And if you don't, you may have something else that you collect. And so this would be interesting from a collector's standpoint. Anyhow, I just thought this would be a little bit interesting kind of uh, episode something different from what we have ever done before, where we are actually talking about playing cards. And let me just point out this first gentleman, Jack Penny, has, uh, again, a Kickstarter campaign, which uh, within the first 24 hours had already met its goal, and it's going to be running throughout the month of May. And there are still perks that you can get through the campaign. And if you'll just follow this little uh, URL that I've got down below here, or if you just go to kickstarter.com and just do a search for Sensu, that's S-E-N-S-U, and it will pop up and it will go to his page. But again, it's going through May the 30th of 2020. So if you're watching this later, this is probably not going to not going to work for you. You won't be able to to purchase anything, any of the perks that he's got. Well, let me stand aside and introduce our first guest, which will be followed then by our second, which is the way our numerical system works. And we will begin to then please welcome my guest, Mr. Jack Brutus Penny here on The Magic Word. Well, right now I have with me a, a guest who's all the way actually in Japan, just outside of Tokyo, and he's going to be talking a little bit about uh, playing cards. I should say more than just a little bit, because there's a lot to say about playing cards and how they are made, and I've always been interested and had a fascination about the interest in these specialty decks of cards, not just the kinds that come off the line from, from bicycle or anything else, but the, the specialty kind. And so today we've got someone who has actually done this in the past and he has designed a new deck, and is, I want to talk a little bit about that. So please welcome my friend, Mr. Jack Brutus Penny. Hi there, Jack. How are you? Hello. Yes, um, I'm fine, thank you. Thank you for having me here, Scott. Oh, glad to have you. Uh, yeah, as I said, I'm, I'm interested to know about just kind of the, the, the process on that. What, what my, my first question is, what is the appeal of these specialty decks that people want to collect these things? I mean, I see Theory 11 and others who are releasing these, plus like with you having a, a Kickstarter that may be an individual kind of a thing. What 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 is the fascination of that? Yeah, uh, well, speaking as a creator, not as a, as a collector, um, for me, the fascination is just a, a different medium to put your, your designs, your artwork on. So it's a new kind of creative canvas 
um, to you know dis display your your own narratives. Uh, but as a collector, I think they are they are gorgeous pieces, um, both for display and for for use. Well, that was what I was going to ask about about use. It seems like most people, I think, or collectors might want to maybe even display a sheet, or they might just take out one or two cards, uh, the Joker and the Ace or a King or something, and display those kinds of things. But I, I, I would think a lot of times people may not want to use them because, number one, they're more expensive than just buying a regular deck of cards. Uh, and also... Oftentimes, you would ha they will have a story with it, I guess. You almost need to tell your volunteer, let me explain what these cards are, because I've got some decks of cards in which the uh, they're all black. In other words, the hearts and the diamonds are black instead of red. And particularly in low light, it may not be the preferable deck to use. Uh, so address that a little bit. No, absolutely. So I think um, in the industry, there are a few different kind of categories of cards. So there are cards for magic. Um, that I'm sure you're very familiar with. There are cards for cardistry, which is, which is more about the handling um, of them. And then there are collector cards, which is more what, what I work in um, as, as an art-focused medium. And so, as you say, collector cards aren't necessarily for handling, um, though many collectors would still want them to be traditional to some extent. Um, but many collectors, uh, in my knowledge, actually buy two decks of each card and one they'll, they will, will never open. And often collector cards are numbered and sealed so that they're more valuable um, before being opened. So it's much like art that you kind of invest in it and keep it um, hopefully forever for your collection, but um, some people for resale or, or however else they'll be using them. Now, when you design these also, are you contacted by a card manufacturer saying, can you design something for us, uh, or do you just do them independent? I, mean, I think some designers do have um, direct collaborations with different uh, organizations, whether it's the manufacturer um, or some other kind of group. But for me personally, I, I start from the concept I created, and then I... Uh, contract the the publisher um, to to print them, right? Uh, and because I'm thinking, for an example, with Theory Eleven, where they've got out recently the 007 cards and the Avengers yeah. deck of cards, and they've put out different things like that, and you can buy a, a a deck or a brick or whatever you want, but they're a limited edition. Once they're gone, they're gone. Uh, uh, certainly, do they? Do you know if they design them themselves, or do they have a staff, or do they? contract with people like you to design something for them? Oh, no. So, I mean, it, well, it depends on the studio. Um, so I'm independent. Um, so I, like, create and design myself studio. Uh, yeah, so Theory 11 um, and a few other studios, they, they have staff. So, I mean, they, they design in-house, but I, ah. I don't know, like, uh, exactly who is responsible for what and, and how much they work together. Um, on them, but it's my understanding that most of them have one or two key designers. When you're trying to find the printer, how do you go about finding the right person or right company, I guess, that has the right quality of stock? I assume that you have something in mind that you have a quality that must meet your specifications. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, there aren't that many um, big quality printers. And so when we're talking about um, collector cards, People really go for, because they come with a price tag, they're going for quality production as well. Mm -hmm. um, so most people go for USPCC, um, being both because of its quality, but also because of its name. Um, That's United States Playing Card Company, by the way. Yeah, yeah right? United States yeah. Playing Card Company, yeah. Um, for me, because I am more on the artistic side, as I said before, so it's more pushing the creative um, capacity of using playing cards as a medium. And USPCC is more traditional, so they'll make uh, the kind of casino decks that you, that you typically have. So I tend towards two other companies, but I've been using uh, EPCC, which is Expert Playing Cards Company. Mm -hmm. And Legends is also another. So there, there, are, there are a handful of reputable other manufacturers, but USPCC tends to be the one that most creators really go for. Okay, and are they, 
I know they're cut differently. Uh, the way cards, some some are kind of cut hmm, down and some are up cut a different way as far as how they pharaoh and how they how they feel. Uh, is that something also this part of what you're looking for to make sure that it has a good feel for those who do want to actually use the cards rather than just display them? Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm sure it goes into that, but I think, as I say, I think, say, if you're designing for cardistry, then um, the handling is your priority. If you're, desi if you're designing for uh, collectible cards, um, so art cards, then maybe, um, so for instance, my focus is more about um, the accuracy of their printing. So the, um, I and have the registration very, of the colors, the, the way they all fit exactly, together and everything. Mm -hmm. um, so you're not only, for me, I'm printing, say, three different layers. And if the registration is off at all, then um, it, it can really affect how it's produced. So that's the initial uh, ink, the vegetable ink layer, and whether it's a metallic ink on top of that, and then whether there's foiling on top of that. Um, so mm -hmm. registration is, is key to get your art concept um, looking exactly how you planned it. How did you actually get into this? Were you a designer to begin with? Happened to like art or something about cards? Were you an, are you a magician then or what? Um, no, I'm, I'm not a magician, though, um, though I, I enjoy uh, watching it, um, of course. <clears throat> but no, uh, I have been an artist. Uh, I'm actually a nonsense um, writer and illustrator. So I've got a few published books and um, I expanded into different mediums. So for instance, uh, a collaboration with a Japanese potter and we make a clay pots, uh, uh, Japanese white clay pots together. And, um, but going into playing cards maybe about four or five years ago was, was a, quite a natural and smooth step for me because I, I mean, I have quite a few decks at home. Um, I always played cards for me casually, um, but growing mm -hmm. up playing kings with my, my grandmother and betting like pennies um as we play or, or waking up early with my mum and playing um over a cup of tea or something so cards are quite a quite a personal thing for me it's it's not it's not in terms of an industry but it's more of a personal connection right so you're really not a collector yourself of cards uh, i'm so not much a as it collector is cardist or magician i'm uh, a lover of playing cards um <laughs> okay all right literally now, playing with cards yeah the the deck you are currently working on and going to be releasing, uh, you've been working on for about a year and a half. Is that right? Uh, yes, I think most designers and most you know good good uh, collectible card designers maybe work for uh, three or four months um, on a design concept, and they can usually produce maybe uh, three decks a year or something. But for me. Um, it's like a year and a half process. So I, I produce maybe a deck every two years. And so mm -hmm. I won in 2019 and my second will be coming out uh, very soon. So this And is, the this one that came out in 2019, how many card uh, decks did you run? So um, for the for the main card themselves, um, it's limited to only 1000, which is a which is not the smallest print run, but it's it's a very small print run. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe most independents will print about 2,500 is a kind of standard limited print run. Um, some of the producers, that, some of the uh, designers that you were naming before, like Theory 11, usually they have different uh, editions. So they'll have like a, a limited print run edition, which is maybe mm -hmm. 1,000 or 2,500. And then they'll have a standard, which is unlimited. So they can reprint, rerun, and, and keep selling. But when yours is done, it's done. Uh, do they it's break done. the mold, basically, or? Okay. Um, well, I never get the mold, um, but yeah. Uh... <laughs> okay. Um, and the also, I thought it was interesting. The one that you are currently going to be releasing uh, is going to be environmental friendly, or is that something that you had on your last one also? So this is just, this is a personal thing, but that's through all my work. So the last one, um, which I have here, which was a uh, Culturae Animalis. Um, so this is, yeah, it's printed on recycled and recyclable paper, sustainably sourced um, paper with soy ink. Um, when I package, I package with a special kind of wrap, which is um, locally sourced in Japan, made from a sugar cane. Hmm. So like um, everything, everything down to the sticker seal, which is washi paper. So that's obviously uh, recyclable paper. 
and even recycled masking tape. So I, yeah, I, I care a lot and I put that through um, all elements of the design. And maybe also you, you know you're familiar that um, they're dedicated, my works are dedicated to animal welfare. Yes, yeah. Uh, I wanted you to talk a bit about that. I was going to get into that too, but okay, yeah. Sorry. Pick, nope, pick it up. <laughs> um, so yeah, so lots of my, my stories and designs are all inspired by um, animals. So for instance, my stories are like uh, uh, anthropomorphic kind of uh, animals, like how, if you're familiar with Rudyard Kipling's Just So stories, um, how did the elephant get its long trunk? It's, it's that kind of whimsical uh, nonsense. And that goes through all of my design as well. So um, I get a lot of inspiration from animals and wildlife. And as such, I use all of my projects to give back. Um, so this playing card project uh, of cultural animalis, so that's the 2019 project. Um, what we did with this was we used some of the funding to um, support uh, critically endangered mountain gorillas um, to help uh, replant trees in Tanzania and work with their um, wild habitats. And a portion of all of my sales goes to help rescue and rehome um, abandoned and displaced cats and dogs and other animals around Japan, where I live. Mm -hmm. So they're all themed. Uh, so this deck, for instance, uh, are all themed around animals. So um, one suit are all birds uh, and one suit are all cats and, and something like that. So that uh, those designs are on the faces. Obviously, the backs are all going to be the same. The backs are all, yeah. So for this, the backs are all, um, sorry, the backs are all standard. But they're very detailed. Um, so as you, It as looks you like said, a full bleed also as opposed to having a border. Mm -hmm. Full bleed. And the, and the new deck coming out um, is also full bleed and very um, colorful. So whereas this deck was uh, monochrome in that um, you had the red suits and you had the black suits, which is a more standard uh, coloring system. So this is just um, because the new deck is about to be crowdfunded. Um, so I don't have uh, any printed decks yet. So this is just during the process of me printing my own um, at home uh, to test that the artwork comes together as intended. Um, so this is just printed on normal paper, but it's it's a very colorful, um, very busy uh, Design, image. Yeah. Is um, it the same one way as it is the other? I mean, that's another thing, of course, uh, for magicians could use a one-way deck of having the back design that's off a little bit. But are those the same upside down as right side up? Absolutely, absolutely. So um, in my first deck, I was focused on the, the art of it. So it actually was a secret one-way design on the back. Mm -hmm. So in that when you look at it, you can't tell that it's one way um, easily. But in each corner, there are animals hidden. And so oh. when you know that they're there, you realize that it is one way. Um, this, this new deck will be two-way, um, part, partly to suit the design uh, and my vision for it, but also partly because I listened to a lot of the feedback from the first deck and people saying, <laughs> I would love this, but... <laughs> okay. Uh, and I assume this is going to be another run of just a thousand, or are you going to be having more for this next run? No, so um, any deck is a max of 1,000. This new deck will come in two versions, which are distinct. Um, so, so, so they're not just a simple color change. There is a, there is a clear story-driven reason to have two versions, but each one has only 1,000 decks printed. Mm -hmm. And as a stretch goal, if you're familiar with crowdfunding, how stretch goals work? Yes, but go ahead, explain for those okay. who don't. <laughs> um, so for those who don't, you for crowdfunding, um, you have a main goal. And so people basically pre-order um, your product. And uh, if you reach the funding to hit that goal, um, then you have enough to produce the product and then you ship it out to, to all of your backers. Um, but that that goal is to pay for the production of your 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 piece but as a stretch goal um so i can say if we actually hit further so if we get more backing um, and more of these pre-orders or support then we can produce something even more so it's, it's a, like an additional mm -hmm. uh, expansion on the project and so as a stretch goal i intend to print um 50 like one special run of 50 of a kind. 
Wow. Okay. For so those people who are paying extra, very limited, and um, because of that, actually, production costs are in incredibly high um, mm -hmm. because you have to make the whole printing plate um, only, which is which is a major cost. Then only divide that between fifty fifty right. items going to be printed with it. Yeah. Right. Wow. Um, so I would imagine that would be you know, more of an expensive type of a, of a stretch goal on that. Um, the the deck itself, going back for just a moment as to what it is, uh, you are living in Japan. You said you've been there for what, about how many years? 13 years? Yeah, about 13, 14 years now. 14 years. Yeah. Uh, and, and so you've been influenced by some of the culture there, and some of it is origami. And that's just what this deck is based on. Can you talk a little bit about that? And what does that mean? Uh, absolutely. It's, it's my, my pleasure. Um, so the first deck, so Culture Animalis, had four suits, um, obviously, um, but each suit was um, themed after a different animal and a different culture. So one okay. of the cultures was East Asia and of, in particular Japan. One of the cultures was um, Renaissance, medieval to Renaissance Europe, but in particular uh, England, so where I'm from. And uh, there was also uh, Arabic, uh, Islamic cultures and Aboriginal, um, so world, world Aboriginal cultures. So that's from um, Native American Indians to, to Australian Aborigines. Um, so taking inspirations from different cultures. In the, in the new deck, um, it's entirely inspired by Japan. Um, so it's not directly uh, based on origami, um, though there are elements of that, but inspired by very different arts. So Japanese ukiyo-e, which is a uh, wood block prints. Um, so for instance, the famous image of the wave, the, the mm -hmm. great wave of, of Kanagawa, I believe it is, that, um, that is quite famous, I think. And that's ukiyo-e, so that's a wood block print. And also by Hanafuda, which is one of the, like, um, the traditional first Japanese style playing cards. So you may have seen them or people could check uh, Wikipedia after Hanafuda. Um, so they're, they're basically picture cards and they have a lot of games about them, but they don't have any indices or any markings on them. And you have to remember and how, how they relate to each other and what stories they tell between them. Wow. <laughs> uh, so it sounds like this deck would be something if you do have a the whole thing that all the cards should be displayed as opposed to just a couple of them because as you say they all kind of tell a story do you sell sheets of the cards as well so yes yeah, so um as you say so a lot of the the designers sell uncut sheets yeah um so that's just during the print run where they where they make the cards um before they cut them they just take the sheet out Right. Uh, and leave it uncut. So you still see the die lines uh, and everything, but you can see the the whole um, sheet on the on the you know high quality card paper and everything. Um, and then when you display it, you can frame it, and um, you can either display it you know front side so you see the faces of the cards, or back so that you see the backs. Mm -hmm. For I think for most people when they when they display an uncut sheet they usually display the back which is usually um, you know the area where it's the iconic design of of this deck mm -hmm. um, whereas the front at least the pip cards usually are fairly standard. But in this case, you, are you using the use? Every single card is completely hand drawn, full bleed, and every single card has design. So yeah, so in the first deck I sold uncut sheets, um, limited edition again, so only thirty made, um, and you can display them. And my, you can choose, but uh, I would recommend displaying them uh, face forward um, so that you can see the story and yeah, how all of the cards relate to each other um, across the scene. Yeah. Wow. Uh, what is the process in going through from start to finish? I know you said typically it may be three or four months and from design to the completion of the printing. In most cases, in yours, it's taken a year and a half. Is there something that took more time because of the attention to detail or other work you were doing, or why did it take so long? Um, I mean, yes. Uh, like I can't, I can't speak for the um, production and design process of other designers uh, sure. directly. Um, but for me, because I don't have any single standard cards, so I don't take any um, standard pips, every single card is, is completely hand-drawn and, and conceptualized uh, from the beginning. So I'm not just 
I'm not designing, say, a Jack Queen King, um, mm -hmm. a, a court run for cards, which is what most designers are doing. That they're, they're making a beautifully designed deck of collectible cards. What I'm doing is I'm creating a concept, a narrative, and illustrating um, 52 pieces of art, which would blend and marriage well with a deck of playing cards. Right. So that so that's why it takes a bit longer. <laughs> What is your ultimate goal then? Are you wanting or hoping as an artist that you would have these displayed in a museum someplace or for collectors to display? Uh, uh, it, it, it can't be money. I mean, I know there's a lot of money in, in, in selling these, but it's also taking a lot of time. And as far as the, if you break it down, as far as how much you'll be getting per hour for the money you'll be getting back, it would not be worth your time. I mean, as an artist. Um, so what, what's your goal with this? Absolutely, absolutely. I think, um, yeah, again, so most designers, including myself, do want to be able to live off their creations. Sure. Um, <laughs> um, but I mean, I, I do have different uh, motivations. Um, so with the first deck, so let's say it's a two year process, if we include the design, the production to the Kickstarter campaign to then the fulfillment of that and, and continue continuing the sales after that. So so in total it's been about a two-year process and i broke even maybe two months ago hmm. okay so um i i think from maybe two years of solid work and and that's not like part-time that's monday to friday solid work this is your uh, full-time job so i i have a couple of jobs but this is my full-time job but weekends i'm i'm a teacher okay <laughs> and okay. do other things but full-time weekdays i'm a designer and writer, illustrator and writer. And this is my full-time job. And after two years, I made about $300. Wow, <laughs> okay. Um, and that's, uh, so, but for me, um, that's also because a lot of it does do the charitable work and, and um, my other motivations. Sure, of course. But absolutely, with the new project, I certainly hope to, um, to be able to, you know, support my family a little bit more with it. <laughs> there, are, there are many types of uh, crowdfunding programs or campaigns, and why did you choose, and which one are you using? Kickstarter. You're using Kickstarter. Why are you using Kickstarter versus others? Uh, versus Indiegogo. Or, exactly. Yeah. Um, I mean, to, to be honest, there, there's, there's not too much of a, of a deep reason behind it. Um, lots of these card campaigns are done on Kickstarter, which means lots of the the collectors um, and also uh, the, the further reaching crowd already have Kickstarter accounts. So, so they're already familiar with the system. So it's that makes sense. more, there's more likely, it's more likely to succeed if you're on that forum. Um, but also Kickstarter is now further into Japan as well. Um, they're, they're still fairly new here, but uh, Japan has its own crowdfunding site. So Indiegogo and stuff aren't so common here. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think I think it was the best of both worlds for me. So this campaign will begin and end when? So it begins uh, well, in a week from today on the on the first of May um, is launch uh, Japan time, and it and it lasts for one month. So it will end uh, at the end of May. Yeah. Okay. So for the, for the month of May. Yeah, we're recording this now on April the twentieth. So uh, it'll run for the month of May. And where can they find that? And how would I mean? What do you type in as far as doing a search or trying to locate this? Um, so if, if I can just explain a little bit of the concept behind the new deck, so maybe you can see what, okay. the, yeah, uh, what the narrative is. Um, so in order to search it, uh, you need to search Sensu, S-E-N-S-U, Sensu, that's the name of the deck. Okay. And uh, Sensu in Japanese means the Japanese folding fan. So mm -hmm. the kind of fan that, that closes yeah. and opens, yeah. Okay. And so that is the main inspiration for the concept behind the cards. Um, so that's why that's the name, obviously. Um, so Sensu. <clears throat> um, the, con the idea is that in the first deck, um, Culturae Animalis, which you can also still find, um, obviously the Kickstarter is now closed um, two years ago, but you can still find it to explore the page and just see, see, see what, what they look like. The story behind yeah. it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, the the courts court cards in Culture Animalis had Jack Queen King as a triptych. So it, if you lined them up horizontally, 
you could see the court scene. So literally, um, this is this is within the the palace court in in the Renaissance Europe or whatever. Mm -hmm. Whereas the new deck, I've taken that further. Um, so the I, the concept is that uh, one card. So as I said, this is just printed on paper at home to test test the art. But one card, um, the the pip and indices have been. Um, Tilted slightly a bit. puts it at an angle, and so mm -hmm. it creates an elongated canvas, which makes it look a bit more like a tarot deck. Mm -hmm. But what it means is around the border, there's now space where I create um, an art which uh, at face value looks like it's uh, abstract. Yes. But actually, when you... When you fan the cards out. When you fan the cards out into a, into a perfect um, fan of the run, it creates... So the that canvas there, the backdrop uh, or behind the cards, yeah. behind the border that's created, then connects all the way across. Holy moly, that's beautiful! And then that becomes so. For instance, all of the hearts become uh, spring, uh, Japan in spring. So oh my gosh. Wow, there are cool. cherry, there's a scene of cherry blossoms and, and everything. Then all of the uh, clubs become summer, and then it's uh, the sea and a big wave and stuff. So. So there are there are hidden there's hidden art among the cards, and so the idea is one card is a closed fan, and then when they're open together, they become the open fan, the seam. So that's why they're called sensu. That makes perfect sense. Now, yeah, very interesting. Wow, uh, and they are beautiful then as well. So again, going to uh, Kickstarter, I think it's Kickstarter.com, and then doing a search for S E N S U. Exactly. Or if you can't find it also, you can probably search creator. So that's Jack Brutus Penny. Yeah. Jack Brutus Penny. Yes. Um, one other thing, when you were talking about the one you had done a couple of years ago, I unclear I, on what I was hearing then. Could you spell what that is, what type, what the cards uh, were? Sure. So they're called Culturae Animalis. And um, so it's a little bit hard because <laughs> it's in Latin. Okay. Um, yeah. The reason I chose Latin for this um, this deck name is because they're inspired by many different historical cultures. So right. I didn't want to select, you know, English as I didn't want to select one language to define them. Um, so I, I selected Latin as a sort of root language. <laughs> oh, that makes sense. Certainly. Yeah. That'd be so international that way. Animalis, meaning like cultural animal or the animal culture. Okay. Cultura animalis. Okay. <laughs> so that's C U L T U R A E and A N I M A L I S. Thank you. Okay. For those who might be looking for that, because sure. uh, I was unclear what you were saying exactly, and now I understand. <laughs> <laughs> being yeah. in Latin, and I understand why, because of the different cultures that were involved in that. A lot of thinking and everything went behind this. Well, this is great, Jack. Thanks very much for uh, sharing uh, that, and I wish you a lot of luck. And in, in, in the past, on that particular deck on the cultural animalis, is that something that reached or achieved uh, your goal and went beyond the stretch uh, goals as well? Back then? Yes, uh, um, yeah, no, again, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to both talk to you about the industry a little bit and about what I do. Um, but yeah, Coltri Animalis um, reached 210% of its goal, so something wow. like that. That's good. Mm -hmm. um, and it received some crowdfunding awards, uh, mostly partly due to how the process was run, because when I run a campaign, it's a, it's a journey. So um, I interact with everyone, but I also, like for instance, in Coltri Animalis, we, we created an additional gaff card together. Mm -hmm. So through the campaign, one of the achievements we did was also help see populations around the UK, um, especially lobst wild, wild lobster populations. Hmm. And so then we decided together as a community to design um, a new gaff card uh, based around the traditional um, European uh, joker card, but uh, tarot joker kind of card, but changing it to a, a lobster. So, wow. so we we developed we developed some of the concept together as well. Um, so and I would yeah. think also that the shipping uh, I know foreign shipping is expensive, and getting things out of Japan once you you have completed all this and all the cars have been printed, uh, shipping is going to be rather expensive. I think we try to get that to the U.S. or the U.K. or wherever from Japan. Yeah. So a lot of um, companies. Uh, in the U.S. can fulfill themselves um, or go through a different fulfillment um, 
organization. Mm -hmm. um, but for, for most people producing overseas, they for fulfillment in the US, they do use certain certain fulfillment companies. Oh, um, that makes sense, sure. As, gamblers warehouse or, or some others that that help like they collect them and then they ship them out um i'm considering that but probably i won't do that for for so many reasons mm -hmm. um, so unfortunately yeah shipping from me is always an yeah. issue um but because i hand wrap everything because everything is using environmental um environmentally sustainable materials which other organizations can't quite meet my standards Mm -hmm. um, but also because I create a lot of very limited work as well. So, for instance, um, in the upcoming campaign, there's a card cut. Uh, okay. So what that means is where the whole deck has all 52 cards have been cut through to create a three dimensional. Oh, I do see that. OK, yeah. OK. Mm -hmm. So this was done by another artist that I worked together with. Um, but this is a one of a kind piece. Mm hmm. So all of these have to be carefully managed and put together by myself. So it's hard to trust another organization to be able to handle all of that. Right. And the, particularly to ship that out, because if you ship that to someone else and then they sh ship it on, they'll be responsible for that if it re arrives damaged. Rather it than becomes you. a lot more yeah. complicated. Yeah. So yeah. If, if I ship direct to customers, then I try my hardest. Um, uh, there are usually no issues, but if there are usually with the postal system, um, then, you know, I can work with them and I can help the customers. Whereas if there are middlemen, then it gets more complicated. All right. Well, listen, this sounds uh, fantastic and everything that you're doing with these cards and, uh, uh, and going to a lot of nonprofit organizations and the wildlife and every, my gosh, everything that you're doing is just hitting on every cylinder here, I think, of, uh, uh, of everyone's interest, uh, certainly. So uh, I wish you good luck with this and uh, this project and uh, thanks for, for being on this. The name of my podcast is called The Magic Word and I'm always curious to know what it is uh, that's a philosophy. What do people live by? What is important to you? It doesn't have to be a word. It could be, a, again, a sentence or something something my my personal philosophy yeah uh, <laughs> uh like when you wake up my, in the morning go ahead <laughs> my personal philosophy in life is about balance okay <clears throat> so like i uh i spend say monday to friday working on this but uh, whether it's whether it's profitable or not is not my goal um but to, to put the art out there but then uh, i stop at four o'clock and i go and pick up my son from nursery and and i i give him his bath and i feed him dinner and stuff like balance balancing your life i think um in every aspect is important to me as far as my work goes <laughs> then a key word for me is nonsense um, which is okay. you know, whimsy, whimsy, and and a, and a narrative that you can lose yourself in. Yeah, I like that. That sounds great, Jack. Thanks very much. I appreciate that. Uh, uh, you're you're sharing your time with us and also your story. And I uh, think I've learned a lot. Hopefully, <laughs> the rest of the listeners uh, have that as well. So until next time, that was Jack Brutus Penny, and this is Scotty out. Wow, wow, fascinating. Uh, I don't know about you, but I learned a lot right there. Thank you, Jack, very much for being a guest and telling us about the development of your project and how this actually works. Well, next we're going to be going to Kansas City, where I want to introduce to you our next guest, who is a collector, particularly of playing cards, Mr. Sean Rivera. Now I have with me a magician who is from Kansas City, Kansas, and he is a card collector. And by that, I mean playing card collector, not necessarily business cards. That's a whole different kind of collecting. But he is a collector and uh, someone I'd like to kind of talk ab to about collecting uh, playing cards. Please welcome Sean Rivera. Hi there, Sean. Hey, how's it going? Thanks for Fantastic. having me here. <laughs> I'm glad that you are here. And I understand that you are quite the uh, collector of uh, playing cards. Yes, I do like decks of cards, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever have a, uh, a, a, an affinity for collecting other kinds of magic memorabilia? or uh, And then you kind of eventually got into playing cards? Or how did you migrate into that? Yeah, so I, I do collect different things here and there, like you know some posters, uh, some ephemera, things like that. But as far as decks of cards, I, I would say... As far back as like when I was about 15 years old, mm -hmm. I started collecting decks. I got into magic when I was about 10. But when I turned 15, I, I was started getting serious about sleight of hand with card magic and things like that. And I'm actually uh, from the St. Louis area. 
And uh, so I would always hang out with uh, at Gibbles, Gibbles Magic Shop down down there on the landing. Okay. And there was a magician behind the the counter named Bob Cole. And one day we were just you know talking about the different decks of cards in the in the case, you know, like the you know the cheeks to cheek decks, the the stripper decks, the Svengali decks. Mm-hmm. And out of the blue, he asked me. He was like, "So how many decks of cards do you own?" And I was like, "Oh, I don't know, maybe like eight or 10. And he goes, well, you're a piker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're a real and, beginner. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and at the time, I had no idea what piker meant, but I understood that I needed more decks of cards. So I think it started from there and just started gobbling them up. Especially since he was a dealer, you need to buy them from him. It's got to... <laughs> of course. <laughs> you need yeah. to come back and buy more cards from me, uh, right. certainly. Uh, yeah, as for me, all the cards I collect i really i i use and so i keep a, a big fish bowl full of them and i reach in and just pull them out and i buy them by the brick and and put them here but the, but those are uh, for use but i keep acquiring these cards that are unique um meaning they are made by certain magicians have their names or pictures or logo or something on that uh and then there are these other new decks i mean i just recently had one of my uh, patrons who had sent me uh, a 007 deck, which I think is really cool, which is another collection thing I have, another uh, fanaticism I have towards James Bond, uh, which is why I named my son Sean, not spelled the same way as yours, but after Sean Connery. A whole different story, but nice. uh, I was always <laughs> interested in Bond. But And also, I started collecting, but not intentionally. There's a difference in collecting in which and, and accumulating. I'm really more an accumulator of cards. I've got them, but I'm not trying to find a particular kind of card. Is that something that when you collect cards, are you looking just cards generally, or do you have a brand that you go for, or something that's just new that's coming out on Kickstarter or something, or what's, what's your direction of collecting? Yeah, so for me, generally it isn't just you know, anything that just comes out, it has to be something that strikes my interest or catches my eye. Like, for example, if it's a deck of cards that's marked on the back, or if it has a one way back design or something like that, Mm -hmm. or like, uh, or like a Bruce Lee deck, I'm big into Bruce Lee and martial arts. Oh, really? Okay. So, you know, things like that. Yeah, it has to catch my eye. So there are things really, you do have, uh, uh, like you said, an affinity for something that really uh, attracts you. It's not necessarily whatever bicycle is coming out with, or like you said, uh, gaff decks or something. Do you have a set of gaff decks and different uh, manufacturers? I do have a lot of gaff decks. Yes, there's um, um, there, there are some decks that I put together myself that are mm-hmm. gaffed, uh, like here on this shelf here. Uh, these are all uh, gimmick decks. Some of these are gaffed. Some of these are you know, trick decks that I put together. Yeah, as like we're that. looking behind you, we're, you're showing me this line of cards that looks like it's on a ledge, and then you got a whole bookcase full of uh, cards. Looks like that was specially designed, made for cards, because it's just the right height. Uh, it, actually, it wasn't, but it, yeah, it just happened to fit perfectly. Was it for like uh, cassette tapes or something originally? Yeah, I think it was for something like that. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. How many do you think you have? I'm sure people have asked you that in the past. Yeah, altogether, I would say close to about 5,000 decks. I thought you were going to say like 500. I should add another zero on there. (laughs) Holy moly. I've got the right guy here then. Okay. (laughs) All righty then. It's a sickness. Uh, (laughs) At some point. That's probably what your wife and family says. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) Uh, So do you have a room dedicated just to this? Uh, yeah, mostly just down here in my basement. That's where most uh, of the of the cards are displayed. I got, I still have probably a thousand uh, still boxed away in storage and things like that. So, but most of all, most of it is is down here in the basement. I'm, I'm gonna have, I might have a couple hundred up upstairs in the office and and things mm-hmm. like that. Do you think a deck of cards is worth more if it has not been opened, or less? I think it's definitely worth a lot more. Okay. Yeah, I think as soon as you crack that seal, it goes down tremendously, especially if, if the deck of cards is used. I was going to say, if you take it out and you shuffle them or something, and even one time, there it's a used deck then at that point, of course. Sure. Um, but some of these cards have beautiful designs uh, on the 
on the court cards or the jokers or something like that and i have seen some cards displayed like that so in that case do you buy like two decks one you will leave sealed and then another one you'll take out and display exactly yeah i always buy two decks of each one to keep sealed and uh -huh. hopefully it'll you know i'll be able to sell it for more later on that's what your wife's and hoping always... Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, but the other deck I crack open and play with and, and check out the faces and stuff like that. There are some decks like Tally Ho's or Jerry's Nuggets where I'll, I'll buy a brick at a time. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, you know, two or three decks each. And when you do take those out, have you got them displayed in a certain place or do you put them in behind glass somewhere? Like a framed poster type of thing? Sure, yeah. Like back here, I got them, uh, maybe maybe a thousand of them lined up along the wall back here. Right. I have a, a literal card table uh, over there by my, in front of the TV where the decks are nice and displayed inside it, like, like a coffee table kind of a thing where you can mm -hmm. see through the glass. Got another table over here where there are a couple hundred just lined up and displayed that way. Uh, <clears throat> and... Have you ever, when, when you do take them out, do you ever use them uh, or is it just for display purposes only? Most of the time it's just for display purposes only. Um, the only time I ever perform is with a red circle back tally ho deck. That's, that's really what you only see me perform with. I just Why like, is that? You know, I like the feel, I, I like the finish. They farrow nicely. They last longer than uh, bicycle cards do. They got a cool design. But, uh, you know, thanks. one of the latest decks I got here are the uh, Avengers. That is a new deck, yeah. I just the saw Ethereum those come 11. out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just got those. Those are pretty cool. I cracked this deck open just to see what the, who was on the, uh, the characters that were on the faces and things like that. But I'll, I'll never perform with it. <laughs> well, that's, I haven't opened up my 007 deck either. I have seen pictures of what the cards look like, but they don't have pictures like of sean connery or <clears throat> and uh daniel craig and others uh on there they just uh but but do does the uh, avengers deck have pictures of some of the superheroes on there yeah pretty much all the superheroes uh spider-man thor iron man they're, yeah, they're all in the faces wow uh now whenever uh, again that's something that just kind of attracted your attention it wasn't because because i know theory 11 comes out with these decks all the time then too oh yeah uh and as we have magic conventions also, I'm assuming they must have some collectors, playing card collector conventions. Because there's some people, I'm confident, who are not magicians at all, but for whatever reason started collecting playing cards. So is there a community that you are associated with, or do they have events like that? Yeah, that's something I just realized recently within the, within the last couple of years. Uh, there is uh, a community called 52plusjoker.org, and that's ran by Lee Asher, actually. Hmm. And, um, and it's people from all over the country, all over the world. They, ju they just collect decks of cards. And they're not just magicians. They're not just flourishers, cardists. Mm -hmm. uh, some, some of them don't do magic or cardistry. They just like to collect them. They just like the artwork, perhaps, of the cards and everything then, too. Sure. So in relation, your collection, in relation to those of others, who have been collecting for years and older than you, are you considered still a piker in their world, in their, in their world? <laughs> I would think so. Yeah. <laughs> so there's some, I assume who have tens of thousands of decks of cards. Um, not that I know of. I mean, I have heard of a couple other people that might have about a 5,000 decks or something like that, but I haven't heard of anybody who has more than that. I mean, people who have, who haven't actually like, created and produced their own decks of cards to sell right. and all that right. stuff. Yeah. So that's not anything that has attracted you to go out and try to make your own deck of cards, has it? Or do you have your own deck? Uh, I don't have my own deck yet. Maybe sometime in the near future. Yet. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah. yet is the key word there in that right. sense. <laughs> Sounds like there is something in the back of your mind. <laughs> there is, yeah. <laughs> Maybe, possibly, yes. near future. So uh, an obvious question that others probably have asked whenever they come down and their eyes are just <laughs> wide like saucers and they say, holy cow, has to be, what is your favorite deck of cards? Sure, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's a good question. Um, I do have some original Jerry's Nugget decks. Um, I don't have very many old decks of cards, like from the, 
early 1900s or late 1800s or anything like that. Probably, you know, the, the original Jerry's Nuggets around 1970. Mm -hmm. uh, those are probably my favorite. I have a deck of those I was given as a gift many, many years ago, and I have not opened it. And I think it's an original deck. I don't know. How do you determine without opening a deck if it is an original versus, you know, something that's new? That's a yeah, well, <clears throat> one thing about the Jerry's Nugget decks that I learned uh, from Lee Asher is if you take an X-Acto knife and slice open the the uh, the side panel of the box yeah it will have the date printed on the inside of the flap well no that's interesting okay yeah is that the same on all or just on the nuggets yeah not uh yeah just on the nuggets well wouldn't that decrease the value that. by doing that <laughs> it sure would <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's kind of like carbon dating something. You got to break it to find out uh, yeah. how old it is. <laughs> right. Oh, now we know. Oh, it was original. Well, it's not worth as much now. So, <laughs> worth nothing now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, it is interesting. I know they do produce Jerry's Nuggets now. And the brick of those, how much is, is a brick typically cost? And a brick for those people who are listening to this and just for informational purposes, maybe not planning on getting into collecting, most will know what? There are a dozen decks in a brick, right? Right. And the quality uh, does vary quite a bit from, from card to card, uh, I'm certain. When you're talking about, for an example, the tally hose that you have, how, uh, how good they are. Versus, bicycle has gone down in quality over the years, I've got to admit. I mean, the quality control even on the registration of the colors and everything, plus the, the feel and the way they shuffle and everything. I know that Richard Turner had worked with them for a long time, and but then he stopped and seems like they went back to their old way or whatever. But I, I, I think the tally hose probably is the better. Yeah. The, uh, the tally hose have changed, uh, slightly over time too, but they are still pretty good. They fare well. And uh -huh. I don't know if you know about the, uh, the Elmsley trick where you take a, a nail file and, and go across the corner of e each corner of the deck and file, file off the, the edge there. That'll help them, uh, fare a lot easier, a lot better that way. That is a good idea. You would have to do that over the whole deck. You don't, I mean, while you're holding it, you're not doing it by each card or whatever. So this way it has the same. Yeah. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Uh, and so just on the edge, on the corners, you're saying? That's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All four corners. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, going back again to uh, not the Jerry's Nuggets, how much are those cards, original decks going for now? Original Jerry's, I would say in the neighborhood of, Two hundred and fifty dollars up, for okay. Each deck. I thought I had heard three fifty, uh, an estimate at one point. That's not unreasonable, right? That sound right. That, that's normal. Yeah. Is it okay? Wow. Is that one of the most expensive decks that's available out there to collectors currently? It's one of them. I mean, I've seen decks sell for thousands of dollars. Why? Like old, rare, like from the ah. yeah, from like the seventeen hundreds, eighteen hundreds. Mm -hmm. Like only like maybe 10 exist in the world or something like that. Those well, that makes, for thousands. that makes sense. Speaking of which, have you been to the Nashville's House of Cards? I haven't been there yet. No, I'm surprised uh, because it was built on cards, basically, because from what I understand, the owner bought a collection of playing cards and there were some very, very rare cards there that hold some high value and they've been framed and put on these posts that are in the restaurant. So you can see these uh, frame cards and has little plates and tells you something about that. Uh, so there are a lot of cards on the walls and uh, around there that are um, apparently from an expensive deck from way back when, some of the early, early cards. Nice. Mm. Yeah, you need to go check that out. So uh, as we start to wrap up over here, what would you say is, uh, well, I'm curious, when did playing cards start? I kind of like to tell stories when I'm performing with cards and telling them a little bit uh, about the history of that. I just kind of have made that up, but uh, I, I know they were original pieces of art and the king and the queen would have these made for them and they were very expensive and their son, the prince, was the jack and all the rest of that. I know the uh, Devil's Prayer Book or what is that also called, the uh, uh, Soldier uh, prayer book of how, what the cards are and everything, but how far back do they go? When uh, do playing cards originate? Yeah, I don't know exactly uh, details on the on the exact history of that, but I would guess maybe back to the 1200s or 1400s. 
I'm pretty sure they're uh, French in origin. Okay. Yeah. And have you seen some of those older cards? Like in the other people's no, collections? I sure haven't. Okay. Oh. Again, I didn't know, like through that organization you were talking about of Lee Asher's, of whether they had gotten together and you've kind of shown cards or, you know, that kind of a thing. And, or, but, yeah, uh, you know, for some reason, I just joined uh, his club uh, about two years ago. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm actually looking forward to his next yeah. convention. It's going to be in uh, Niagara Falls, New York, coming up. So your real passion is collecting, not so much on the history of the cards. Sure. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, so it looks like as young as you are, you're going to have another 5,000 before long. <laughs> <laughs> that would as be they nice. <laughs> as they you know continue. Actually, uh, a, a good friend of mine not too long ago, I think he quoted, it, it may have been Fitzky. Uh, and Fitzky was talking about books and he said, you don't need a lot of books. You just need the right books. Right. Mm. So I'm, I'm starting to think that way about decks of cards now. You don't need a lot of decks. You just need the right ones. So maybe uh, in the near future, I might start unloading some of these. I don't know. <laughs> so the right ones to you are the ones that mean something to you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like the Tolly Hose, the Jerry's Nuggets, the Bruce Lee decks, you know, things like that. Yeah. Things that mean something to you as opposed to just having them. Yeah. Because right. I'm sure for a while you probably were buying just about everything you could get your hands on. Just about. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So any uh, last words as for collectors who might be interested in this kind of a thing? Because I many years ago started collecting business cards just because they were free. So it was a very cheap way of getting into collecting. And before long, well, not many people use business cards. Now <laughs> they are getting to be collector's items for real. Uh, but I have hundreds and hundreds of business cards. And I know Al, the only collected business cards also. And whenever I was talking with people who were wanting to get involved in collecting, I would say that's an easy and cheap way of getting into it. Playing cards, I think, would be about the next cheapest thing they can get into collecting. But uh, any suggestions as to uh, for people to begin collecting and what how what, what they should do to get started? Yeah, I would say you know just collect as many or as much as you can. You know, go to the the Theory Elevens, the Penguins, the uh, Expert Plan Card Company with Bill Kalouche. Uh, there's a company called uh, KingsWildProject.com. He makes some fantastic playing cards. Um, PlayingCardDecks.com. You can get them all there. Wow. Okay. Well, good suggestions. I know a lot of these things are available then online. And um, but if you get a chance still to hold them in your hand, well, you really don't get to hold them in your hand because, again, you don't take them out and play with them. You just kind of look at the, the pack and say, right. I think I'll take one of those. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> that's great. Well, Sean, thanks very much. Uh, as far as the last word, what's your magic word? Yes. Thanks for asking. I would actually have to say in the words of Bruce Lee, be water, my friend. Be water. Ooh, I like that a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bend like with the willow tree. So that way you're going to be water. <laughs> very good. Yes. Very good. <laughs> Thank you very much. So from the mouth of a true aficionado, a playing card collector, Mr. Sean Rivera. Thank you very much for being my guest over here today. My pleasure. Thank you. All right. Uh, so again, for the magic word, that was Sean Rivera. This is Scotty out. Wow, uh, another great conversation. That was wonderful to learn something from a real collector. Uh, <laughs> 5,000 decks, yeah. Uh, that's either a serious problem or a serious collector, <laughs> however you term it, I guess. But no, no, I think he's just a wonderful collector. And uh, thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. I appreciate that, Sean. And also, I thank you, Jack, for sharing your education with us. So that way that we learn more, I certainly did. And I hope you, the listeners and viewers on this YouTube video, also learned a lot. And you got to see the visual part of this, which is a little bit different from what you normally would get from just the audio podcast and when you're listening in your car or when you're at the gym or walking your dog or whatever uh, so this is a little bit different I hope that you're enjoying the YouTube videos that I'm using to supplement the audio portion of that and if you do please subscribe just subscribe to the magic word podcast uh, so down below here on YouTube just be sure you subscribe so that way you get to know everything that's happening whenever we're going to be going live or we have a new broadcast that's been released you will find out about that you'll be the uh, first 
first to hear because they'll give you a notification once you subscribe. Also, be sure and subscribe to our pod letter. So this way that each week we send out these uh, newsletters or pod letters. So you will be the first to know who uh, that, that are, who is coming up that week, who's coming up next week. Perhaps some suggestions from the archives. And if there's a contest running, you'll be the first to know about that then as well. So be sure to go to themagicwordpodcast.com over there and you can subscribe as well. And if you've got just a few moments, please just leave us a five star rating on iTunes or wherever you uh, can leave, wherever you listen to your podcast, wherever you download the podcast, if you do. And if you like this video, why don't you just hit the like? Uh, a lot of times people will watch these videos and just move on to the next one. So I hope if you've got just a few moments that you will uh, hit the like button and perhaps leave a nice comment if you happen to enjoy this particular episode as well. Since we were talking about something a little bit different than usual, this was again having to do with playing cards and collecting and everything like that. So until next week, stay well, get booked, and remember, be fluid like water and yet have balance in your life. (laughs) This is Scotty out. 